So I, I want to take a little bit of time to uh, give some biblical perspective to the whole potential of, of understanding grief. And again, these are kind of some myths as well that people have <clears throat> that I feel need to come into play. Now, I want to preface what I'm going to say and the verses I'm going to use with the statements that these verses are not intended to be theologically complete. Because yes, there's other avenues that come into some of these. I'm looking at these verses as helpful mindsets that are in Scripture that I believe can be a blessing and an encouragement and a help with understanding grief and even how to help someone. And these are some actually that I found beneficial as well. All right, the first myth, you might say, that people uh, that come into play, and if you do have your Bible handy, you're welcome to turn with me to these. I'm going to read them. Is that all bad things that happen to me are signs that God's mad at me. This is a real common misnomer that a lot of Christians even have in life in general. And it's a misnomer because the Bible doesn't say that that's a flat statement to be true. Uh, and you say, well, what about Job? And what? Now, that's another situation, and God told us why that story happened. I'm talking about normal, everyday living. If your viewpoint about God is that He's up there dreaming up bad things to happen to you, you're not understanding what God's Word says about Him. James 1.17 makes it very clear. He says, uh, verse 16, Do not be deceived, my brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of His own will He brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. That doesn't sound like a God who's looking for ways to... to uh, to be mad at you about, to bring about negative things here, or because, well, you didn't please me, so I'm going to make this happen for you. And so I, I find that many times that mindset comes into play. Now, one of the reasons I'm doing this, a lot of, I've had several people ask me, Dave, how did you handle, with both of your wives, how did you handle the why question? And I have to be honest. I didn't struggle with the why question very much, very little. It did not plague me. And I'm telling you, one of the reasons why I didn't struggle deeply with the why question was these verses that we're looking at. I already understood and I believed them. I knew that God didn't kill my wife to make, because he was mad at me. That's not how it works. That's not how he works. And so I had to go back and look at these. Another one is 1 John. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. 1 John 3, 1. Beloved, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Now it's true. Maybe your parents would do things to you because they're mad at you. But he's making a distinction. The love of our Father is not like that. It's not like that. And so the idea that bad things happen to me that are because God's mad at me is a misnomer. It's really not the biblical principle. Okay, another one. God will not let bad things happen to me. Whoa! Where did that come from? God won't let bad things happen to me. Now, in the Gospel of John, we have an interesting statement here that kind of dispels this. John 16, 33 says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Listen to this. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. This mindset is that 
God's not going to let anything bad happen to me. So if something bad happens to me, something's out of whack. No, that's, that's not true. In fact, Jesus promises, hey, you're living in the world. There's going to be some bad things happen. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And so some of these myths are a, a challenge. To, okay, another one. God uses bad things to get me to re repent of some sin. Now, I want to just, I, I don't have time, of course, in this class session to cover the whole subject, but the Bible makes it very clear about how God works on his children to deal with sin. And you'll find the dominant way isn't by causing bad things to happen to us. All right, now these verses, Romans 2, but, but let's look at some of these. John chapter 16, since I'm already there. John 16, 8 through 11 has some interesting things about how God brings about conviction for sin. And it doesn't include bad things. In fact, John, John 16, 8 says, um, And when He has come, meaning the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment of sin, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you will see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. That point makes it clear that one of the ways God deals with sin in the life of believer is through the Holy Spirit. He didn't start by making our life miserable or doing something. It's the Holy Spirit. He'll, he'll, he'll convict of sin, not making it in life miserable. Another one, very, very powerful one, is in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Very interesting. Of course, you may be familiar with this. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. How's God dealing with sin in a person's heart there? Through His Word, not through all these bad things that come along. And so many times I find even a lot of Christians, they, when a bad thing happens, they immediately think, oh, I must have done something wrong. Must be sin in my life. God's dealing with my life. Something bad's happened. I wonder what it is. Well, <laughs> if the Holy Spirit hasn't already worked on you, and if you got not getting conviction from His Word, I would be real slow to blame God trying to make you repent of sin on this bad situation. And so some of these negative myths, these misconceptions can come into play and be a challenge for people going through the grieving process. And you being aware of it, can help, you can help them out. All right, this one, another one. When difficulties happen to me, it's a test from God and He pulls back just to watch to see how I handle it. Well, there are those who feel that way. That if a difficult things, in their hap things happen, this is God testing them and he's waiting to see how you're, uh, how you're doing the test. I saw uh, a quote the other day, just recently, that, uh, by the way, don't forget, the teacher is silent during a testing period. Well, that may be true in the classroom, but Matthew chapter 28, which is the missionary challenge, some of you may be familiar with that one, and he says, when he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, and then he says, and lo, I am with you, except for when you're being tested. Oh, oh, no, it doesn't say that. Lo, I am with you always. So even if you are maybe going through a testing period, it's not God pulling back away. He's going to be with you even during the testing period, if that is indeed what's going on. All right, this one here is another challenge. A Christian who is walking with God will be exempt from bad things in the world. Now, we've kind of already touched on that uh, in, in John, but I like 1 Peter. Um, I've, my studies in 1 Peter, have in, I've, I found it to be extremely um, practical in, in, in our lives today. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 13 Verse 12 says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. Now, that's a, quite a passage. Don't be surprised. That's what he's saying. Don't be surprised whenever there is trials. 
And I've known Christians, even when somebody die, dies, you know, like, oh, wow, wow, why did... Wait, he says, don't be surprised when, 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 these, when trials come along. That's the mindset we find for God. They, God says, don't be surprised whenever these fire trial which is to try you as though some strange things happen to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when His glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. And he goes on to give more, more help there. So I, I find that the challenge is, don't be surprised, it's gonna, but we have the answers. And this is where I, I'm convinced that if Christians became the experts on understanding grief and loss, the world will be the path to our door. What if that were true? What would that do to the out, outreach of your church? If people in your church became really good and known in the community because they handle and understand human loss well, what would that do to the potential for outreach? It could, I'm, in my, my opinion, it could expand it tremendously. And so um, there's a lot, of, a lot of challenge to come in there. All right, and then this last one is when I'm hurting, God pulls away from me. One of the key passages for this course, and you want to be sure to write this one down, and we're going to turn there right now, is 2 Corinthians chapter, two, uh, chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and the key passage here that we're going to look at is verse 3 and 4. And I find lots of Christians, even churches, even church leaders, ignore this principle in their ministry and in their outreach. For 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4, Beloved, um, uh, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Notice, who comforts us in all our tribulations that we may be able to comfort those who are on any trouble, including death, including losing your job, in, including the loss of a relationship including the loss of your health in any trouble that we might be able to comfort them with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the suffering of Christ abounds in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Very key passage for this whole course. 1 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4 vital in understanding that I'm convinced that God brings about things in people's lives and many times those experiences are for other people's benefits even sometimes more than your own I've had that experience several times in my life I mentioned that my dad was killed in a farming accident when I was 12 years old fast forward I'm in college and I have a Christian service assignment and that my second year in college and that Christian service assignment was to teach high school boys Sunday school class at a church not far from the school I thought oh my word here I go you know so I walk in and here's these seven boys none of which were really wanting to pay attention and my job was to teach them for one entire year Sunday school and so I did that and early in that experience I told my story I told how that when I was 11 years old, 12 years old, my dad had been killed in an accident. He had died. And a couple years later, my mom remarried. And that blending of a new, having a, a stepdad, if you will, was a big challenge. It was difficult, but we, we did that. And so I told my story and went on and finished the year out. A year and a, a, year and a half later, it was now it would be my senior year, the freshman class showed up at the school where I was, the Bible school where I was. And in that class was a young man named Warren Ryherd. Guess who he was? One of the boys in that Sunday school class. I says, Warren, what are you doing here? He says, well, he says, I heard what 
happened to you with blending a, having a stepdad and you turned out all right, so I figured I could too. And I realized, you know what? My experience was a guide and a challenge and a help to him. So it wasn't just me that this was happening to. It was for the benefit often of others. So, uh, you know, the 1 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4 is a, a pretty challenging one. And, uh, of course, here again, based on as a result of having lost two wives, here I am sharing what I've learned with you. Obey, responding to this truth right here. Very, very challenging passage uh, for us to know. 